Good morning. Time for our Bible study this morning. We're getting into uh, the very active part of the book of Exodus as literally the confrontation between Pharaoh and Moses is about to begin. However, I want to caution you, and we'll get into this as we get into the study, this really isn't a confrontation between Pharaoh and Moses. We'll, we'll see that as we get into this. We'll describe that a little more. Um, for the moment here, uh, let me just read to you. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 7, uh, verses 8 down through 13. Let me read to you those verses. We'll have a moment of prayer, and then we're just going to dive right in this morning. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and did just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. For each man cast down his staff, and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them as the Lord had said. Let's pray. Father, we, we come to you, Lord, this morning, and as always, Father God, we need you and your spirit to, to truly come in and to speak to us as we look at this. May we understand what is happening here, Father, and not only understand it, but apply it into our lives today. For, Lord, it does have application. We need to see this. So help us, Lord. Uh, illumine your word to us through your Spirit's uh, guidance. And use this time, Father, for your glory, that we might draw closer to you through this. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, When Pharaoh says to you, Prove yourselves by working a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and cast it down before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. Now, as we noted last week, Moses and Aaron now appear to finally be all in on God's plan. They are no longer uh, in the mood to argue with the Lord, it appears, which is good, uh, which is very good. It's a good place to be when instead of being in the no mode with God, you are in the yes mode with God. And so God gives them specific instructions for how to present themselves to Pharaoh. He knows Pharaoh will demand that they prove their credentials by some miraculous sign. After all, they, they are saying they are representing Almighty God. And so Pharaoh would expect them to be able to prove their credentials, perform some miracle. And so they're to do exactly what God had told Moses in the very beginning to do, to cast the staff down so that it might become a serpent in the presence of Pharaoh. Now, there is some question as to whether or not the staff that Aaron was carrying was the staff of Moses. Was it Aaron's own staff? It is probably Moses' staff. Um, we don't know that with any degree of certainty, but it also doesn't matter because as we pointed out back when this whole thing took place, when God demonstrated this miracle to Moses, it's not the staff. It's God's power. The staff is a plain wooden stick that has been formed into a tool, and God transforms that through his divine power. But it's also important to understand that while what staff is being thrown down, whether it was Aaron's or Moses, is somewhat irrelevant, what is not irrelevant is what is really transpiring here. And again, it would be easy to characterize this as a confrontation between Moses and, Aaron, and, and Pharaoh. Some might even uh, proclaim that this was a battle between Israel and Egypt. But neither of those is entirely correct. You see, this is not a battle between Moses and Pharaoh. It's not a battle between Israel and Egypt. It is a battle between Satan and Almighty God. This is a spiritual battle, not a physical battle. And what is about to transpire here is not 
Moses imposing his will on Pharaoh, Israel overcoming the nation of Egypt, but rather it is a complete repudiation of the false gods of Egypt. Each action that is about to happen, each of the plagues that are coming up, and even the sign of the staff turning into a serpent and, and what transpires there, will demonstrate that it is the Lord who is the one true God, and that all of Egypt's false gods are just that. They are false gods. So Moses and Aaron did exactly as God commanded. They cast the staff down. It becomes a serpent in the presence of Pharaoh. But we should not expect that that's the end of the story, of course. Of course. So Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh um, as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his staff before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. Verse 10. Moses and Aaron do just as God has commanded them to do. Now, we're not told that Pharaoh has demanded some proof, but we can certainly, certainly imply that he did. God told them that Pharaoh would do that. And it makes sense. Remember, Pharaoh considers himself to be a living incarnation of one of the gods of Egypt. He considers himself to be divine. And he's not going to just take the word of Moses and Aaron He's going to demand some proof. That just makes sense. And so they cast the staff down, and as God had promised, it becomes a serpent. This corresponds exactly to God's plan. Moses is as God to Pharaoh. Aaron is his prophet. And God had told Moses, when Pharaoh demands the sign, you tell Aaron to cast the staff down. Moses is as God to Pharaoh. Aaron is the prophet of, of Moses. This is... God orchestrating this from the very beginning. Of note here is that God kept his promise to Moses, of course, once Moses began to obey him. That God would work these signs and miracles. And while Moses had argued numerous times that he was inadequate, God showed that he would supply all that Moses would need in the midst of this confrontation. <clears throat> now, verse 10, there's some confusion uh, at the end of verse 10, when it says that Moses, that Aaron cast the staff down and it became a serpent, there's some confusion about the exact meaning of the word that we translate as serpent. Um, it is different from the word that was used earlier in Exodus when Moses had cast the staff down and it became a serpent. They are two different words. In fact, this word can refer to any large reptile, really. Um, and there are some scholars out there that will tell you that it didn't become a serpent, it became a crocodile. Which, of course, would make some sense in Egyptian mythology. Obviously, the crocodile is a very important symbol of deity within Egyptian mythology. However, further on, um, we will read that the staff, the, the, the same word that's used further on in Exodus to describe the staff that became a serpent, it goes back to what was used originally. So uh, while there might be some confusion, you can, you can find out there some commentaries that will say, no, this became a crocodile, not a serpent. For one thing, again, it's not a huge point, but for a second thing, let's not get too overboard with this. It probably just became a very large serpent, quite possibly a cobra, a large cobra which would also be very significant in Egyptian mythology. But you see, this is not just a zoological question. Was it a crocodile? Was it a cobra? Was... It's a theological question. Because the serpent in Egyptian mythology, in Egyptian theology, was a direct symbol of Pharaoh's authority. You see, nobody who witnessed this could doubt that this was a direct challenge to Pharaoh's claim of being a god. What Moses and Aaron were doing by casting this staff down in front of Pharaoh and his servants, they were claiming divine authority over Pharaoh. That will escape most of us as we read this, but it would not have escaped Pharaoh, it would not have escaped 
the courtiers that would have been present and even the wise men and the magicians, the sorcerers, as the word describes it, they would have seen this for exactly what it was. And so in verse 11, Pharaoh responds to the challenge. Pharaoh summoned the wise men and the sorcerers, and they, the magicians of Egypt, also did the same by their secret arts. Pharaoh recognized the challenge for what it was. He called forth his own magicians, the sorcerers and the wise men, and they're able to perform what appears to be the exact same miracle. Now, some question this, uh, thinking that what the magicians did was simply sleight of hand trickery. And there are cases, uh, um, even as late as the 1960s, uh, there were stories, accounts coming out of Egypt of snake charmers who would put a cobra down on the, on the ground and, and apparently just lay their hand near the head and then it, they would pick it up and it would be as stiff as a board. It would be like a staff. And then they'd shake it and throw it down and come alive again. There's a nerve in the back of a cobra's body right near the head that if you press on it just right, you will actually paralyze the animal. And so some think that what the magicians did was simply a trick along this line. But let's not disallow something here. Satan is capable, capable of performing false signs and wonders. But we should note here that all Satan is capable of doing is imitating the reality. He can only imitate. He cannot create. Which explains to some degree why so many of the world's false religions out there have some familiarity with Christianity or Judaism because all Satan has done is take parts of that, corrupt them, and then use them to deceive people. I believe that those men were carrying wooden staffs that Satan used his power to transform into serpents. This, again, is a spiritual battle between Satan and God. This is not a physical battle. And so while it's possible that the magicians just used sleight of hand, which is all any magician of today uses, this is also a spiritual battle that was quite probably and possibly fought with power beyond anything that humans can comprehend on both sides. Because again, remember, it does say here that they use their secret arts, these sorcerers. So I wonder what went through the mind of Moses and Aaron, though. They've done what God has commanded them to do. Aaron has cast the staff down. It's become a serpent. And suddenly the sorcerers of Egypt step forward and they cast their own staffs down and they become serpents as well. I'm certain that Moses and Aaron would have been shocked and maybe even a little dismayed by this obvious challenge to the power of God. It, it, I mean, they're only human. Don't think that Moses and Aaron are superhuman. They're not. They're human. They've done what God has commanded. They cast their staff down and it's become a serpent. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the sorcerers of Egypt step forward and cast their staffs down and they become serpents. And it's like, oh no. Verse 12 says, for each man, the men that came forward, and we don't know how many there were. It was at least two, obviously, because it's a plurality. For each man cast down his staff and they became serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. I imagine there was a sense of self-satisfaction in the heart of Pharaoh and his sorcerers <clears throat> when they were able to replicate what Aaron, actually the Lord, had done. As if to say that their authority was easily dismissed because the, the, you know, the sorcerers of Egypt had equal authority. Yeah, and I, I, again, I just have to imagine there was probably some self-congratulatory looks going, yeah, we did that. Yep. You know, yeah, you got your serpent out there. Well, our serpents are out there too. Very self-satisfied, I'm sure, at least until 
the serpent of Moses and Aaron swallowed the serpents that they had conjured up by their secret arts. I mean, it would have been quite the sight to observe, don't you think? Pharaoh and his magicians laughing and then suddenly watching their serpents destroyed by the serpent of Moses and Aaron. I would imagine that the laughter would have died very suddenly. And as we shall see later on in the account that we're given in Exodus, it's actually the magicians of Pharaoh who will be the first ones to admit that they are unable to mimic the true power of God. And I think it's also important to note something here. Aaron did not make any incantations or try to cast a spell. He had no need to use any form of secret arts. He simply did what God told him to do. He cast the staff down in faith, believing that God would act. Most likely, the magicians of Pharaohs made elaborate commands and motions, calling upon their false gods, various incantations, trying to cast a spell, as you were. And then to see their serpents devoured would have been a huge, huge blow. And it also must have had a very profound effect on Pharaoh. Because suddenly, as I said, his own claim to divinity was challenged as soon as the staff of Moses and Aaron hit the ground and became a serpent. Remember, the serpent is a direct symbol of the divine authority of Pharaoh in Egyptian mythology. At the very least, this should have had a very profound effect on Pharaoh. But as we read in verse 13, that wasn't the case. Still, Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them, as the Lord had said. It's easy to think that Pharaoh should have relented. I mean, what he should have done was step down off his throne, fall to his knees, and worship the one true God. Now, here, you know, the, the English translation says still Pharaoh's heart was hardened, but in reality, in the in the Hebrew here, the word that we translated was hardened. It's in what is known as the perfect tense, which indicates a completed action. Pharaoh's heart was hard. It wasn't hardened further. It was already hard. Um, it was so heavy with his own self-aggrandizement his own self-delusion, that he was not going to listen to truth. And we shouldn't be too surprised. God had predicted this, and also God had said he would cause this. He would make it happen. It's hard for us to grasp this and, and how God works in this way. But remember, God had said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart. And though I multiply my miraculous signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. That was earlier in Exodus chapter 7, last week's lesson. He will not listen to you. God had not only predicted it, but he said, I'm going to make this happen. Because remember, God's intent here is not just to free Israel, but also so that every person in Egypt would know who God was. Moses and Aaron should not be surprised that Pharaoh would not listen. Maybe, I don't know, perhaps if Pharaoh could have seen just how hard his own heart was, he would have been terrified. Yet the truth is that Satan is the penultimate liar. He blinds those he deceives, and only when God's light shines powerfully into their darkness can they possibly be freed. And so the opening act has begun uh, in what will become the release of Israel from bondage in Egypt. And it's begun with a direct challenge. Moses and Aaron have, at least implicitly, told Pharaoh, you aren't what you claim to be. The fact that their staff devoured the staves of the sorcerers should have been a very clear message. You might be able to imitate, but you cannot stand under the power of the mighty hand of God. 
What's coming next in Egypt is inevitable. God's mighty hand will move, and it will move against Egypt. And as we shall see as we go through the coming weeks and we look at the plagues that God brings upon Egypt, one by one, God is going to tear down the false gods of Egypt in front of their very eyes. And even with that, Pharaoh will not relent until the very end, even though his own magicians will at one point tell him, we can't compete with this. Their God is far too powerful. Sometimes I wonder what it will take in our own lives and in the lives of those around us to finally get the message. The false gods that you're worshiping, they can't stand. They won't stand. How much does God have to bring to bear in your life to tear them down? so that you will finally acknowledge the one true living God. That's a scary thought. I hope it doesn't go too far. As we'll see, God is willing to go as far as necessary to make it happen. May our hearts not be hardened. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, for your word and the opportunity that we have to, to look into it and for your spirit to use it to look into our own hearts so that, Father, we might not allow our hearts to harden to your voice. Create within us, Lord, a new heart, a clean heart, one that is open to hearing you, one, Lord, that is open to submitting to your command, one, Lord, that is willing to, by faith, place our trust in your Son, Jesus and stop trying to work out our own salvation on our own. But rather, Lord, may we work in our salvation for your glory to draw closer and closer to you every day. And we'll give you the thanks and the honor and the praise and the glory in all things. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. I hope to see you next week.